All right, we've got the gentleman right there. How long were you in prison for? Okay, I was sentenced to nine and a half years, and he ended up serving just under six. And I was released by way of Connor. Have any of you guys seen that movie with Nicolas Cage? All the prisoners are chained on the plane, and our federal armed federal marshals have got guns on them. I was on Connor for about two days, and then they put me on a regular flight um, from LA back to London. And my mom and my sister were at the airport and crying. And the first thing they did was something to an Indian food restaurant, so I could pig out because that's my favourite food. So I hadn't had any good food. Um, for so many years. I'm still a yoga practicing vegetarian to this day after we got the, the dead rats in the, in the jail chow. To this day I still don't eat meat. So, Alright, anyone else? Go on. What kind of drugs were you on? What kind of drugs was I on? Club drugs, ecstasy, ketamine, speed, um, downers, like Xanax and Valium, Soma, Somas, um, pills like that. And um, in terms of cold, cold turkey, it was like, right, I ran through my life getting, all, getting more and more high, but I didn't realise there was this cloud that I was putting in my head, and it took me months of being in the jail before this cloud lifted from my head. And I could look back and think clearly, and writing my life story with this cloud out of my head and reviewing my life, I was like, my God, you're lucky to be alive after all the things you did, all the drugs you did, and all this stuff. And um, it just completely changed the way I think, writing about my life, um, and seeing you know, all the errors of my ways. That changed me as a person. Literature changed me as a person as well. I was told if I read, it would improve my writing. So I ended up reading almost a thousand books during the entire incarceration. In 2006 I read 268 books alone and I wrote, I wrote them all down, every single one, and, and rated them. My sister who's got a degree in literature said, you lucky bugger, people have lives and jobs, there's no way anyone could read that many books in their lifetimes. Because uh, I'd never read a book prior to jail since um, To Kill a Mockingbird was required reading in high school. That was the last book I'd read. Everything I'd ever read until jail was stock market books, and that was it. I was never interested in, in, read, in reading and writing. And that just completely reversed after my arrest. My sister always wanted to have a book out as well, and she's a journalist now. And I've got a book out, and um, she's actually about to release a book as well about my case and the effects it's had on my family. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Did, you ever, did you ever think about or attempt? I certainly did think about suicide. Um, I generally don't bring that up at the talk because I think it sounds self-pitying. You know, like I said earlier, I did take full, I take full responsibility for breaking numerous drug laws and putting myself in, in here. Um, but there were moments when I got moved a year in, the prosecutor, when my bail was doubled, I was moved to maximum security with the cockroaches and, and a lot of murderers. And I had a pink eye infection, one of my, my eyelid could barely open. My girlfriend, she'd been charged with one prescription pill found on the day of, our, of the raid without a prescription by the prosecutor, just as a way to stop her from visiting me, because co-defendants can't visit co-defendants, and she was my lifeline. She was coming in three times a week. So all these things hit me at once, a year in. And I was thinking about suicide, and I would think about just lying on my bunk and slashing my wrists and just letting all the blood come out and just lying there and letting myself die. I was told I was going to be, I was facing up to 200 years. I thought I would never have a life again outside of the prison system. So yeah, I did, I did feel that, that, like that. And I generally don't bring it up because I think it sounds self-pitying. Um, but what got me through it was I would look at the photographs of my girlfriend and my, my family, and I would look at them and it would give me the strength not to do that. And I'd think, how's my mum going to react when she gets a call from America saying her son has just slashed his wrists and he's dead in an Arizona jail cell? That would just absolutely devastate And I couldn't, couldn't do that. There's just no way I could do that to my mum. So, yeah, just looking at the pictures of him giving me the strength just, just to just keep going. I had, there was a hand up at the back. Yes. Sorry, I forgot what it was. You've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs>
That's not good. Go on. We'll, we'll give you time to remember it. Go on. Okay, there are minimums. Okay, talk. You, you asked first off about the, the minimum standards of the prison for prisoners. Let me just address that issue first. In the federal court system, there's a case, it's the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office versus Hart, where the federal court established the minimum guidelines for prisoners, such as you allowed recreation, prisoners should not be in insect infested environments, you're supposed to have so many calories of food a day that you can eat. So the conditions in this jail are actually in flagrant violation of federal law. Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who's proclaiming to uphold the law, is actually violating the law by maintaining these conditions. And he's never held accountable. He's one of the most powerful people in America. He was on George Bush's steering committee. That's how powerful this guy is. He's standing up to Obama right now and nothing is being done about it. He's flagrantly just like that, you know, just giving him the middle finger, basically, and he's getting away with it, he's just making massive news headlines over there from it. Now, in terms of the murderers, you asked specifically, do I think murderers um, should be in horrible conditions like this? Was that the question? If you treat people like animals, they're gonna, some of them are going to return to society and behave like animals, and even the murderers, some of them are going to get released someday if they're serving life sentences with parole. And they're going to be, you know, they're going to be you are my neighbours. Maybe, maybe at some point in time, do we want these guys coming back out of jail as enemies of society, or do we want them rehabilitated and educated so that they could become productive members of society? Um, people like Erwin James, who's a, guard, a Guardian journalist, he was a murderer in the prison system in England, and he educated himself. He got out. And he's done well for himself. So I think that you must give them some education and rehabilitation. If you treat them like this, but well, they're getting recruited by these Aryan Brotherhood gangs or the Mexican Mafia or the Mau Mau's or whatever it is, and they're coming out with all these racist tattoos, and they go from smoking pot, um, they get in here and where the prisoners are all shooting up heroin and shooting up crystal meth, they get out enemies of society. You can't give a job to someone like those people I showed you earlier on the... You know, that, those guys with the tattoos all over, who's going to give them a job? They've got no chance. So I think murderers definitely deserve punishment, but let's try and educate them and rehabilitate them. The Scandinavians take the lightest approach, and they've got the lowest recidivism. Sheriff Joe Arpaio paid Arizona State University $10,000 to do a study to show that his hardline conditions were improving recidivism. They did the study and found out it was the reverse, and he said, you guys are wrong, I'm right. You wouldn't even listen to his the whole study he had commissioned. Phoenix, which he proclaimed himself to be America's toughest sheriff, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, his domain is Phoenix. Phoenix is the highest crime rate in the entire <coughs> country. So it's not working at all. 